this episode, I'm joined once again by writer and philosopher Tim Howells to discuss Bruno Latour's text, Facing Gaia. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. But if you'd like to support the podcast and keep it running, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Tim Howells, thanks very much once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thanks, James. Uh, we are going to be discussing, so we, um, yeah, we sort of, a while ago, we, we, we discussed going through the works of Bruno Latour, and we've, we've sort of tackled um, We Have Never Been Modern, and Massimiliano Simmons, I'm going to dis- discuss, is it Laboratory Life with him at some point, uh, which he was very excited about, and he wants to also tackle the pasteurization of France, but we are going to discuss uh, Facing Gaia, Eight Lectures on the New Climactic Regime by Bruno Latour, of course. And this is a book which is uh, an extended and reworked uh, text from the 2013 Gifford lectures. And I believe the extended and revised versions of these lectures, these eight talks, which is really what the book is, this was published, I believe, 2017. And this is by Polity Press. And, um, you know, I've now spent more time with this book of Latour's than any other of his works. And... You, when we first discussed, when we just after our discussion on the first book of Latours that we tackled, you said something interesting to me. And I said, "Well, what should we tackle next?" And you said, "Well, you know, facing Gaia is ultimately." You, you, you said that you think it's really his magnum opus. I mean, this is his. You know, you don't want to say best work because it's all very difficult and different, especially over such a long time. But. I can see what you mean by that now. Now I've spent so long with it. And really, in a way, and I'll say this just for myself, this, after reading this, this comes across as um, sort of the philosophical text of the age in relation to perhaps the biggest scientific, existential, anthropological, and societal question of our times. I don't know if you'd have some agreement with that, Tim. Well, I wouldn't actually say it's his magnum opus. Oh. And the the uh, very long book, An Inquiry into Modes of Existence, 2013, mm-hmm. is the key to his corpus, I would suggest. It outlines a number of modes that he believes are operational in epistemology today. Facing Guy, if you like, is an outworking of that. Uh, tracing perhaps three, science, politics, and religion. And I think the context is crucial, as you pointed out, James. These were originally six lectures in the Gifford Lectureship Series held at the University of Edinburgh, perhaps the most prestigious theological lecture series in the world, dating back to the quest uh, with a prestigious um, roster of speakers over many decades. I think that context is crucial because the concept of natural religion is a thread running through this series, this book. And also, I think the lecture format itself is important. I think I said to you before, for me, Latour is best understood as an essayist. He's at his strongest in terms of his style when he writes in shorter nuggets. I think for me, the essays are the glory of his work. And you're quite right to say this book is presented here as eight lectures. So there's a sort of um, trope offered here. This book is in the form of lectures, and that reflects the original format in which they were delivered, a six-part lecture series at the University of Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. Do do, do you, I mean, it's a peculiar question, I guess, but do you think this book could have worked in a in a more traditional format of a, of a you know an all encompassing theory, or do you think it needed because it's dealing with such seemingly different topics and and wide ranging topics? Do you think it needed that uh, you know that sort of fragmentation? It does need that fragmentation. It's extraordinarily wide ranging, as you note. I would even suggest it has the form of a sermon. <laughs> an eight-part sermon series. There's something curiously didactic and hortatory about this book. It's both an academic treatise and also an appeal. And I think your reference to existential is important here. This is a heartfelt appeal um, by Bruno to a conversion of life amongst those who read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And that conversion is a, I mean, this religious language is extremely key. To, and, the, and the emphasis on natural religion is extremely key, as is the emphasis on the idea of secularity or secularism. Um, and there's this, I mean, calling it of conversion is uh, positively, uh, you know, it's completely apt to call it a conversion because Latour, in a way, I mean, this is really at the beginning of the first, the first lecture, is really emphasizing the the absurdity of us not taking this this reality seriously and not taking this complete change of our reality and, and what we're seeing seriously and trying and attempt you know making this attempt to address what what it is in our language which really disallows us to actually you know a conversion is a leap and what is it that disallows us to make this leap and i mean do you think do you think he manages to, uh, you know, in, in any articulate sense, address what it is that that needs to change for us to be able to really see the truth of this matter? Well, I think he diagnoses in that first lecture two errors, if you like, as we approach the new climatic regime, as he calls it, as we look at, as we read the news, and does that familiar feeling of despair <laughs> descends upon us? What must we therefore do? One of those would be overaction. This would be a disproportionate trust in the possibilities that might arise from human technological intervention. Mm. And this passes out in the form of the good Anthropocene and such concepts. So that's an over dignification of the possibility of human intervention. But the one he examines in more detail in this text is an underaction. He calls it a disinhibition, um, a disproportionate trust here in the hope that something will just crop up. And there, right there, we see the religious uh, inflection that's to take place here. One understanding of religious faith might be what he calls quietism, to remain. Um, in a sort of mystical bond of submissive trust. God will somehow intervene um, to make right what has gone wrong here on earth. And we see there a, a, a Christian doctrine, if you like, but it can be bastardized and mutated because one of the appeals Luke always going to make to us here is that there are forms of religion that can generate just the right sort of agency, just the right sort of action, mm. one that doesn't overstate the possibility of humans to make things right, but which calls us to responsible, careful, attentive action. And I would suggest that's the appeal that the book is making. It's significant, of course, again, going back to the context, the Gifford lectures are lectures on the theme of natural religion and it's traditional for the speakers to riff off that topic. Um, but of course, we're talking here about evidences from the natural world for the uh, existence or intervention of God. And what Latour does at the beginning of this book is to say, what is this nature in which we're seeking evidence of God? He's going to complicate both the, both the concept of nature and then the concept of religion that is built upon it. In place of those, he seeks what he calls a nature too and a religion too. This is a mode of understanding the natural world that he will call Gaian, and then a mode of religion that he believes is attentive to that. So in, in a sense, I mean, to throw in another theological term, is does do you think Latour sees us in our current state before we've moved into these second iterations of religion? Um, do, you, do you think he sees us as fideists of two sides? So a fideist of humanity, just pure faith in humanity. You know, don't, we don't need to think about it. Humans will, you know, as people commonly say, they'll think of something. Or fideists of, you know, in, in the traditional religious sense of God will think of something and we don't put our reason in its correct place. We don't allow reason to, yeah, find its correct place. Absolutely. And actually one of the themes that comes up, as you know, later in the book is that of apocalypse. 
He suggests that however secular we might be, however modern we might consider ourselves, we are apocalyptic, but in a bad sense. We believe that in some way the the troubles of the end have gone are now behind us. We've passed over into a into as it were a heavenly regime of certainty, uh, progress, development, and growth. And I think we can see that, can't we? However reflective we might want to be, that in some ways. To be modern, to be Western, is to have been told the narrative that things will carry on as they always have done, that we're on a tram line, a trajectory towards greater uh, development. Uh, We say, don't we, uh, I want to leave the world, I will leave the world in a better place for my children. My children will be more prosperous than I will be. And there's something about the climate crisis that breaks in radically to that narrative. It disrupts. It says the world we bequeath to our children might not be as good as the one we inherited. Mm. And I think there's a sort of danger of a psychological collapse there, because if there, if you've already passed into the end times, let's say through the Enlightenment or the birth of modernity, then to be told that the end is still ahead of us is very dangerous and troubling moment. And you can see perhaps why there is a form of psychological collapse amongst those who seek, who are extremely attentive to the climate crisis. Uh, Why are people deciding not to have children? Um, Look at some of the narrative of Extinction Rebellion, a movement that I support, but which, you know, can sometimes lapse into these post-apocalyptic tones. The Torah seeking to, as it were, get back to an older religious understanding of the end still being ahead of us Mm. and not yet having happened. And that actually for him is a positive move because it means everything's to play for. There is still a form of agency um, that we can own, um, but it's a responsible form of agency. Um, The future is still open, says Latour. The horizon is still there to work towards And I think he's trying to combat that sort of flattening effect that many of us do naturally feel when when reading the news about glaciers or other things like that. Mm. I mean, it's almost like um, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Deleuze and Guattari when they say, nothing ever died of contradictions. And perhaps we're entering into a time where, well, okay, we'll, we'll finally test that thesis of whether or not you know, how, as you say, a psychological collapse, because that a psychological collapse comes about when ultimately you have to integrate two contradictions, two ways of being which aren't compatible with each other. This idea of uh, it's always going to get better. I'll leave the world in a better place for my children. And well, there's the climate crisis and you, you can't have both of these. And that's where you find the collapse. And Uh, You know, to bring in something else, uh, you know, I'm already verging a little bit off, but I would like to bring him in because I know you're fond of his work as well. But I mean, everything you've spoken about so far just is, is, resonates the importance of Vogelin, of, you know, the the, the immunitization of the eschaton, of the end times. But really, we've misunderstood that the way that's coming about, it seems that really, I mean, what we've sort of done is negatively brought about the eschaton in the sense that, well, we have brought about our end times, but they're the end times coming from a completely different, quote unquote, realm and that of nature, which is a question we'll get to. But that's the end times that, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're not getting the end times we wished we'd imminentized. Indeed. And he... He makes innovative use of the work of Eric Fergelin, mid 20th century German American political theorist, to precisely that end. Fergelin was seeking to situate humanity in the in between, the metaxis, as he says, of imminence and transcendence. If we overly imminentize, then we end up with flatness and there's a risk of political co option. We're vulnerable to take over by those who, as it were, elevate themselves above the imminent. But if we overemphasize transcendence, then we drift away and we end up with a sort of Gnostic spirituality that um, removes us from the concerns of the earth. So I would say Latour is right in that Virgilin space, in the middle, in the in-between. But there's something I think as well, isn't there, about Christians? If you think about those early Christians who are called to faith, with the hope of the parousia, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And they were called to live in that in-between period. 
And the Apostle Paul, actually, in the second letter to Thessalonians chapter 2, seems to suggest that God is holding back the end such that, and here's another verse from the first letter to that same community, the end is being held back such that, quote, your labor in the Lord will not be in vain. So perhaps there's the idea here that you need to have an end in order to have a productive present. If the end is there and held in place by, in this case, the sovereign God, then somehow the present is opened up. It's not closed down. It's when you don't have an end or where you've already exceeded the end and gone beyond it, as the moderns like to think they have. We've gone beyond all the confusion of the end times, if you like, in the 17th century. But actually, Christians can have faith in an end that dignifies the present and, and as Latour would say, repoliticizes the present. Because one of his arguments in this book, which he gets from Carl Schmidt, is that there's been a depoliticization of the present. And that explains our skewed reactions to the evidence that is coming to us from science. You must change your life, say the, say the scientists. And we have no resources to do that. There's no politics to, by which to negotiate that. <laughs> mm. but, I mean, this, this notion of religion, I mean, uh, of, as you said, the early Christians of this, this uh, ever imminent end times, this sort of the promised land in a way. Um, it, reminds, it's rem it reminds me of a conversation I had recently with Colby Dickinson, uh, the theologian, who, who said that ultimately Christian theology is one of a constant positive disappointment because you're always in the acknowledgement of that intuition of something which is, well, we don't get it yet, but yet we still have to work towards it. Our labors have to go towards it. And so there's an aim, but it's an aim not of anything you're really going to get in, in any sense that you, uh, of this world. And th this seems to be perhaps the the modern problem. And I mean, as, as you said, we've, um, we've gone beyond apocalypse. We've also famously gone beyond history, right? History is now part of history, apparently, but the, he's, he's, so, hmm. So what do you think, how would you articulate, what, what do you think the important distinction Latour makes is that we need to do, that it's important for our reimbuement of an aim between religion one and religion two? What is the key difference there in making that leap? Well, the first thing where he starts is to unpick the concept of nature. And I know we've discussed this in previous podcasts but what is this concept of nature under which we're supposedly unified? If a scientist says, here is some data about atmospheric pollution, that data is supposed to mobilize us, right? We're finding it isn't. And Latour will say that nature with a capital N is a very poor political convener. Um, it, it, it actually prematurely unifies people because we're told that this is how things are. The laws of nature... Um, will proceed as they always have done, cause and effect. And he introduces instead this figure of Gaia as a slightly different understanding of how the natural world works. In fact, it's the inverse understanding. So the first thing he would do is to say, what is this nature that under which you live, you modern people, and that convenes you as your metaphysical paymaster, if you like? What is this God to which you're bowing? Uh, and religion one, the artificial, the negative form of religion that he seeks to critique is modeled precisely on that. It too has a God, capital G, who simply ordains things as they are. It's a cause and effect phenomenon. And so humans are deanimated in the presence of that. Well, at the time of the Anthropocene, those realities have been turned around. We're entering a geological era where humans are an equal player with the natural world, if you'd like. That's what the Anthropocene tells us. Your footprint is now registered in this strat stratigraphic record. So he uses the occasion of the Anthropocene to, Anthropocene to say can, how and, and we must move from nature one and religion one into nature two and religion two. And Gaia is the figure, the motif, um, by which we can do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you were to ask Latour today, 
what the overarching message of his work has been. He will say to you something like, it is to bring about a Gaian politics. So he believes that by replacing the concept of nature with a capital N by the concept of Gaia, we can actually reorientate our politics and with that, our religion, our culture, our society. That's one big claim. So what is what I mean, it's the key question then really facing Gaia. What is what is I mean, so one thing we should we should address, I believe he passed away recently. Gaia is a concept which comes from James Lovelock. Um, and this so is Latour taking this entirely in the love Lovelockian, you know, sense? Or is he, you know, reformatting it in some some way? What is La, uh, Gaia for Latour? He certainly offers an innovative and an idiosyncratic reading of Lovelock. But Latour did have the chance to visit Lovelock on at least one occasion before his death. Lovelock, as we know, died last month at the age of 103. And Lovelock himself was extremely enthusiastic about this strange French (laughs) philosopher and his interest in his ideas. But if nature, capital N, is that which... um, unifies the world on the basis of law, cause and effect, that there are substances that have effects, then Gaia is asking, is inviting us to see the world in a slightly different way. How is the world, um, how is this earth we live on um, composed of overlapping jurisdictions? How is it composed of um, entities, objects, subjects, Um, that um, have influence upon upon each other. How, in that sense, is the earth um, delicately and fragilely maintained in in place um, by this extraordinary uh, homeostatic and regulatory mechanism that is called Gaia? Um, And it's that fragility, I think, and that... Um, compositional nature that Latour is trying to capture through the earth scientific concept of nature. Um, There are two things I think that Guy does for him. One is it presents every single entity, every single thing that there is in the critical zone of the earth as having agency. We hear in part because of the weathering of sedimentary rock that has um, maintain the atmospheric conditions we need to live and breathe. Mm. Um, The second thing that Gaia does is it doesn't scale that up. It doesn't move to a second level of metaphysics. There is no, as it were, entity goddess of Gaia. It's not that Gaia is some thing out there maintaining these conditions providentially. Gaia is the name for that progressively composed assemblage. So in contrast with the concept of nature that did precisely have those that figure, um, Gaia is something much more delicate, much more fragile, much more provisional. And I suppose Latour seeking a politics, a religion, a culture that is in the wake of Gaia rather than in the wake of nature, capital N. Mm. So a politics or religion that wouldn't have a recourse to sort of give over its responsibility to something, you know, outside of those bounds, because there is no outside of those bounds. You know, we, as, as, as you said, with the Anthropocene, if our footprint is being registered, then we are part of it. And thus we need to take responsibility of the whole thing. And there is no sovereignty, which we could sort of quickly in a panic run to and say, look, we've messed up. Can you come and sort this out? You know, that's there is no um, there is no planes here. That's a lovely way of putting it. And actually, there are very practical ethical um, implications to this. So we have an iPhone in our pocket, and we say, um, "Is it the right thing or not to have this iPhone?" Well. We could go to Google and do some preliminary research, but actually to really answer that question, we'd need to spend a life inquiring. We'd need to go beyond the laboratories of Western, of California, all the way down to lithium extraction um, farms in Chile. Mm -hmm. Um, In some ways, modern life seeks to package up that inquiry, doesn't it? 
It's, it does not want you to ask those questions. It does not want you to dig down. But at the time of the Anthropocene, it's the most important ethical duty we have to ask more, to find out where our agency is overlapping and impacting others. And I think it's in that sense that the tour is non-modern. Um, he does not seek to, uh, there is no immediate answer. The only answer is found in going deeper and deeper into sort of sensing and uh, attuning ourselves to the impacts our behavior choices and behaviors have on others. And the climate crisis is the occasion to do that mm. precisely because it's telling us your agency is now intrinsically wrapped up in the fate of the planet. There is no human facing a deanimated nature anymore. Mm. So I, uh, this is this is really interesting because so in relation to what you were saying about uh, religion one, nature one, they this, the relationship between those seems almost like <laughs> you know many of the claims of like church and state that you know these things should be separate and we we do this a lot the moderns do this a lot they have this we have a relationship with nature and um I, just, just from a discussion i was having recently with uh, a druid actually who has a great emphasis on nature but moderns tend to if you look around just the world almost every object or everything you can say nature or not nature or artificial or nature and everything becomes segregated and we do this with you know nat we have natural parks for instance nature's over there it's out of the way that's the messy uh you know gloopy filled thing which is all nature and strange and yet ultimately nature's everywhere you know the air is nature the, we, my pc monitor would be covered in microbes if i looked at it at that level and so it, it, this is a peculiar way for me to segue into this, and it's more of a philosophical question, I guess, Tim. But it seems that in in thinking in this way, Latour hasn't moved all that far away from his influence with Ser in the idea of relational, communicative thinking. That that the, our relationship with nature doesn't need to can't be this one of uh, transcendence where we're, there's this big separation, but it has to be in relation to a relational thinking. Yes. He cites the work of his mentor and friend Michel Serre very often in this text, uh, in particular Serre's uh, 1990 work, The Natural Contract. One thing that Latour would critique, however, is the idea that there is such a thing as nature with whom we may enter into contractual relationships. He would say that that is a residue of a Hobbesian, Leviathan-type contractual state. Um, and he's seeking to, as it were, pluralize the entity that Serre calls nature. There is no nature, because nature is that which we detect, that which we're sensitive to, um, this is the great lesson of Latour's early work. Um, we don't work on the basis of um, substance, but on the basis of performance. Nature is that which registers itself to us in its effects. And that's what Latour studied through the work of Louis Pasteur and others. Um, so... That in a sense, this is this book here is a blueprint for a new contract with the world, but it certainly is taking us on from that which Michel Serre proposed in the early 1990s. And I think that's because Serre, of course, was writing before the time of the Anthropocene, if you like, before the time when this new geological era had intruded on our consciousnesses, he at that time was not able to register what it would mean mm. to enter into a contract in the new climatic regime. So this book is so topical. And I think it really could be a low star for us for many decades to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I'm in complete agreement. So I mean, in terms, especially with anthrop Anthropocene, it seems to be one of the first, which is really addressing the issues with the Anthropocene, whilst I would say, perhaps you'll disagree with me a bit, but he's being not necessarily critical, but he's immediately not just taking this term Anthropocene um, 
you know, with it, by its own logic, he's saying, well, what what's actually happening when we begin to use this term Anthropocene? Because this language once again enters into these forms of separation, and the human becomes this whole other thing, and 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 the the notion of language becomes a problem because once again. It, once again, I mean, it's almost like a Cersean problem of like, you can't describe the taste of coffee. How can we talk about nature? And this equally is a, a seems to be a problem for Latour that as we enter into these discussions, we are losing, we're losing the thing that we're talking about. Once again, we put it at a remove from ourselves. Indeed. And so as I think you mentioned, James, think of the ways in which we deploy the word, the concept of nature. What does it mean to talk of human nature? What does it mean to talk of natural law or natural rights? What about going to the supermarket and buying a yogurt that claims to be 100% natural? Um, There's a concept of nature as that which is simply given, encoded in all those things. And Latour's seeking to use his earlier work in science technology studies to uh, deconstruct that. Um, He also thinks that climate sceptics relish the earlier, the artificial concept of nature, because they're saying they're able to say, well, um, you claim that your data, Mr. Climate Scientist, is indisputable. But look, I've got evidence here that it was highly disputed in your laboratory. Now, you produced some initial data that was challenged by your colleague. You then reworked it. Um, there was then an email chain with other colleagues that then went into peer review. Look, this is disputed. And from that, uh, we can have climate denialism or more subtly greenwashing. Um, Latour would say that it's that dispute that is precisely the the, uh, the, the, the it is in what science inheres. Science comes out of that, those trials of strength as someone, as it were, registers an effect and says, does this effect register again on you? Um, can we replicate that effect? Um, and so the world is revealed, the world of nature is revealed not through cause and effect, but by loops, feedback loops. Um, And a claim about the world is made more robust through time as it gains more allies. This is the sort of language that Latour used throughout the 80s and 90s in his descriptions of what science is. The classic example of this was the so-called climate gate situation that emerged at the the, um, climate research unit at the University of East Anglia in 2005. Mm. Um, some very important atmospheric science data emerged from that lab that was used as proof of climate uh, changing climate conditions. And then there was an email leak. Do you remember this? Mm. Where huge strings of emails between these scientists was leaked to the Daily Mail. And the press used that as evidence that these so-called authoritative um, pronouncements of science were, in fact, highly provisional. They were debated and people had disagreed with them only weeks before. The talk points out, actually, the whole strength of science is found in that model. It's as they're put through those trials of strength that um, the agencies emerge. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's a sign. That is the the scientific method. I mean, ultimately, we're seeing a repeat of that again recently with this uh, now gaining traction, uh, signed signed by a thousand scientists, you know, who climate denial or whatever, um, which is then used as something. I mean, it's once again this. Well, it's entering into the dialogue, and but but the one one thing I would say is that I've asked people <laughs> repeatedly to send me evidence of climate denial, and I've yet to get anything which is even remotely close to sufficient. So that's one thing. But on the 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 just because I wanted to see their arguments, the the arguments generally fall in the camp of well, maybe it's not down to us, which I think is well. That's a difficult argument, whether or not, because it's like, well, <laughs> you're still saying it's happening, which still brings us back into this realm of responsibility and a different understanding of how we can treat the, you know, what we can do and our, our place in it. But because, well, the, the denialism is based, is really, in a way, if it's done sincerely, 
dare I say it, should be coming from exactly the same scientific method, which which bolsters. If you're denying it, well, okay, that's that's fine. That's the same method Latour would be leaning towards to understand whether or not we are we were understanding the situation correctly. I mean, I, I think I'm finding it difficult to, to talk about climate denialism simply for the fact that I've yet to really see anything which is uh, entering into the conversation with the same rigor, rigorosity or rigorousness as people who are admitting to what's in front of their face. I'm trying to basically articulate the absurdity of it, which is quite a difficult thing to do because just as one anecdote I saw recently that someone took a picture of themselves stood in the middle of... China's biggest lake, uh, which is now entirely dry, so they were stood right at the floor of it. So you know that sort of absurdity when you're you're confronted with the reality of the question, it's difficult to 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 discuss the absurdity of denying denying that. I mean that's where the contradiction is coming face to face with the reality. I guess. Sorry, I was a bit all over the place there. And no one would buy a straightforward climate denialism, would they? It makes no sense. And indeed, those who have vested interests know that, I suspect. Um, what they can do, however, is they can challenge and niggle the science for its intermingling of facts and values. Um, you claim that this is pure fact, but look, here's an email string with lots of human factors embedded in it. Um, and then you say, oh, you're a scientist, here's the data, um, you're trained not to lapse into advocacy and to become political, and yet you're here you are on the news pleading with us to change our lives. You've transgressed your domain from the, the rigor of pure science into the world, the human world of values and politics. And Latour is seeking to shake up that whole, um, that whole pot uh, to be a scientist is to be political because it's to assemble a collective. It's to get on a war footing, he would say, is to say, here is my value. Uh, there's no such thing as pure data. The data, as it were, is part of a larger collective that involves um, activists. Um, we speak on behalf of the data, if you like. If you were to merely receive the data and it was it would not change your life that's not real science mm -hmm. he says at the beginning of this book his ultimate aim is to intermingle i think is the word he uses the domains of religion science and politics and actually this is the use he has for carl schmidt because he takes up a definition of politics that schmidt himself gives of groupings prepared to defend their own values against others Mm, the distinction. I mean, one of the most infamous Carl Schmitt quotes. You know, the friend, the friend and enemy. I mean, the distinction between friend and enemy. And I mean, in in subsuming Gaia into that, and subsuming the, our relationship with ultimately our the environment that keeps us alive into that. I mean, there is a there has to be a grouping of everyone being a. This sounds very sixties, but a friend, a friend of the earth. In a in a political sense, that that needs to. Be, I mean, that needs to become a. A uh, global aim. Yes, and Carl Schmidt, writing in the 1920s, as you know, James, was uh, in the context of the chaos of Weimar politics, was very concerned about the ability of a grouping, uh, a collective, a state to defend itself. Um, and he thought the enemy of politics was... Um, the idea of governance, that which can arbitrate. So <clears throat> we've got an issue. What do we do? Oh, we refer it upwards. We call in the police, if you like, a referee. And we say, what is the right thing to do? What is the permissible thing to do? So he, and that's to call in a second level. That's the very metaphysics that we've already seen deconstructed by Latour. So Schmidt's politics, as you say, is one of, um, of friend enemy distinctions is to say, I so, I'm so called into being by this value. This value so, is so, I wish to defend it so robustly that I'm prepared not simply to agree to differ but to go to war, literal war, maybe, but figuratively speaking, it's to say you 
um, you're not an ally to this. Um, I this is my value. This is my land. I will stand upon it. This is the territory that I'm constructing and that allies are constructing with me. So Latour himself, not at all a bellicose personality, is calling us to a sort of Schmittian politics where we're able to say, uh, your value is not mine. And I'm calling uh, others to join with me or then to be against me. So there's an extraordinarily sharp edge running through this book. This is not an anodyne or soft appeal for us to uh, see the reality of the data of science. It's a call to politics, real antagonistic or better agonistic politics. Will you really defend what matters? <laughs> mm. I, a question that I'd put forward there is who are we? I mean, that is, that is bold. Who are we going to war for? Is it ourselves or is it the the 2.0 you know that you mentioned because it can't it can't solely be for ourselves because that 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 enters into this i guess one of the individualistic problems we've had all along that our our you know doing all for ourselves has been the problem so it's imbuing it with this very with with these religious notions of um as you say the the the, the what well, as i mentioned but you were mentioned in relation to the early christians like a like a disappointment in going to war for something that you you may not uh, see the fruits of. You know, it's, um, I guess, a Gaia-based version of building our treasures somewhere else. Or, sorry, uh, collecting our treasures somewhere else. I guess the question in short yeah. there is, who, who, are we, who are we going to war, you know, on behalf of? <laughs> Ourselves and those who are to follow the continuation of, you know, habitable conditions on earth is what Latour would say. But I think the point here is that there is no third party to whom we can appeal. That role was taken by nature, um, as it were. Oh, look to the scientists. They will simply reveal the facts of, 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 to, to which we then comply. But we're no longer, that no longer works. And science never did work that way anyway. There was a, that was the function of a modern, modernist interlude, as Latour would say. Um, Gaia rejects the role of global policeman, if you like. Mm -hmm. Gaia says, um, there is no, um, there is no providence beyond that which you yourselves are implicated in. Um, there is no future apart from your own compositional work. You're a part of the future. The footprint you leave behind is the one that others will tread in, if you like. So in a sense, this isn't literal antagonism that's at stake here. Um, it's a recognition that there is no peace available by deferral upwards to a neutral, disinterested arbiter. Um, we're fully ensconced in imminence. The future of this earth is dependent on us. And that's, I think, the religion, you know, circling back to this religion too. Um, for Latour, religion is that call to responsible, careful attention to the loops that we're forming with others. And, you know, Latour is not himself a theologian, but he picks up a definition by Michel Serre, who suggests that religion is the opposite to negligence. Religion is that mode of attention to our impacts on others, to our neighbors, le prochain, as Latour calls it. Um, and so, you know, he begins to trace some lines. And actually, in my own work, I've tried to flesh that out a little bit by saying, how authentic is this to? Christianity or to some other uh, religious um, or doctrinal program. Uh, but for Latour, um, there are resources. And in fact, religion, he would say, is the only thing that can call us back to that mode of attention. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, so, that's so much in one pot because he's in, in, in stating that the religion is the only thing. He's, he's try, I guess he's trying to 
address the modern crisis at the at the at the exact same moment and i guess not saying that the modern crisis itself you know running from most famously nietzsche forward after the death of god but addressing that crisis in the sense of just beginning with a responsibility which doesn't go outside of its bounds and this is where i like the fact he says that you know reframing the notion of climate change which i think does he perhaps see this as still adhering to something outside might help and just changing that to there's been a profound mutation which really brings it back to there's something quite literally within us which is has gone you know something not well not within because i'm still going in that language of within and without but something has mutated and we need to work to figure this out you know that's yeah Exactly. And actually, at the beginning, he suggests we are no longer in a, a crisis, but a situation of mutation, mutation écologique, a change in the very relationship we have with the earth. So you're quite right. We cannot face this crisis in the old mode, the modernist mode of active human subjects facing a passive, de-animated earth. That is the story we were told by modernity. But that interlude is coming to an end. And the figure under which he thinks the future is held is that of Gaia. And that's why we face Gaia. And actually facing Gaia in French, face à Gaia, is really important here. Because to be modern is, yes, to think that we're looking forward progressively to a brighter future. But really, says Latour, it's to be looking backwards at that which we've passed over the benighted, um, archaic past. Oh, the, those animists, those people who felt connected to the earth in sacred ways. Oh, we're not of that sort, say the moderns. We now understand what nature really is, a deanimated, universally extended, um, infinite, um, perpetual, but not anymore to be a human at the time of the Anthropocene is to understand that the earth is highly animated, reactive to what we do, that it does not any longer have that sense of universality, um, that it's ticklish, as Latour says, and um, indeed may bite back. And the image he often gives is that of the life of Pi, you know, this young man uh, in a boat, with uh, a Bengali tiger, that which we previously thought was safely caged up and um, kept away from us is now right there with us in the boat. And we have to find a new form of politics because if we're going to survive, we have to survive in close quarters with a fearsome beast who sees us not only as master, but potentially as lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we are that young boy in the lifeboat and a wholly new form of political accommodation is needed with the world around us. So that political accommodation, though, in relation to Vergelin, so Vergelin would say that, you know, often when nations, you know, this and this is this is solely Vergelin, when nations tried to, uh, let's say, it's quite, this is quite rough, but spread their values, one of the mistakes that was made is the misunderstanding that the religious foundation wasn't there. And so there's almost this intensive upkeep for something that doesn't have any roots. And eventually when certain people leave, it just... It's not quite there. It hasn't really sunk in. And Vogelin's understanding was that it was because there wasn't the religious foundation, which, say, built America or built UK or built whatever it is. And would 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 Latour be in somewhat of agreement with that, that before this this new form of politicization, which understands that, that this relationship, understands this, this religion 2.0 and this understanding of Gaia, does this religious foundation need to come in first? And it's And it's a a Gaia religious foundation as well. Yes. And he will, he will be cautious about seeking uh, ressourcement in that sense. He's not really looking um, as some theologians would do to bring us back to medieval Europe as an ideal um, state of religion or the protistic period or something else. I think he's saying that, <clears throat> What is the, 
it's, it, we're bound to have a form of religion. What is that form of religion? He actually, he actually uses the thesis of a rather little known and underappreciated intellectual historian called Stephen Toulmin, who suggested that sometime in the early modern period, around the early 17th century, uh, that which was plural, contested, and requiring sort of political accommodation, um, shifted to that which was certain that which could unify from above uh, and could not be disputed. And he links that with Cartesian metaphysics, with the closure of the wars of religion and these sorts of historical moments. Um, since then, um, religion has sought to, as it were, represent decision from above, the closure of all human conflicts by means of decisive and unequivocal revelation. And the religion that Law is seeking to retrieve is that earlier non-modern mode of religion that held open the possibility of going on, of inquiring, of composing this world. Um, so Latour often inverts this saying from the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus says, what use is it to gain the world and yet you lose your soul? And with apologies for the irreverence, Latour would invert that by saying, what use is it to gain your soul if you are to lose the world? For him, religion, and he believes this is most uh, embodied in the Laudato Si document of Pope Francis, is that which calls us downward to this earth, what are we doing here and now? It activates, it politicizes in the best sense agency in the here and now, where the concept of nature as given to us in the Hobbesian settlement deanimates. It says everything is already known and all you have to do is submit. Um, Gaian religion, if you like, reanimates and says you're responsible your God calls you to be responsible in the here and now and not only to look to the ethereal future where we hover above in clouds dressed as angels. So for Latour, true religion is that which is incarnate and calls us back down to earth, if you like, uh, with responsibility, attentiveness and attunement to the composition of the planet in which we live. There is no planet B, he would say, and that would be the greatest lesson of religion. <laughs> mm. There is no planet B. But it, I mean, it's, I guess it's ironic that so many, so many big names quite literally are pushing as their, as their uh, salvation towards a planet B. And it's quite, I always find it quite, cynical and very transparent that they often say well there's water on mars so there's life on mars and i think wow look around why why not why not why not move that mindset down here because you would never hear such a thing around here we wouldn't look around and think well you know the weeds growing up from the pavement are life or the trees are life we don't think about it we take it for granted but a small bit of water on mars and we're we're away using all the resources from here to get to there but i, I guess i want to ask because there's a, there's an odd practical almost like a practical way or line running through this i mean what do you think this politics would look like i mean you, you know you've, you've said that you are you're sympathetic to extinction rebellion and i recent ha recently had rupert reed on to discuss extinction rebellion and those things i mean do you do you think the latours the politics of facing gaia is in line with that sort of thing or do you think there's some key differences he maps out his political vision in more detail in subsequent books so i would suggest that Facing Gaia 2016, French 2017 English, is a manifesto that's then fleshed out in a book called Down to Earth 2018, French 2019 English, and a book that he published this year um, that outlined a new definition of political class. Um, that book is being translated into English and will be published, I believe, later this year with Polity Press. Um, I guess he's going to say what he does say there is that there is no left and right anymore. What sense does it make to speak in terms of solutions from the left or from the right? Um, 
the climate crisis cuts through all of that. It's transversal to those categories. And so he's looking for a new mode of political ecology, as he calls it, um, based on wholly new categories. And the direction to which he's calling us all is to become earthbound. In French, it's the word terrestre, uh, terrestrial, uh, earthbound, um, to understand that this thin envelope that we inhabit on the planet Earth, what he calls the critical zone, is all we have. There is no escape to Mars, as you say, or if there is, it's to send five or six people using highly technical and provisional equipment that mm -hmm. will only survive for a certain amount of time. So it's to call us back down to Earth. And uh, in fact, in the eighth lecture, for those who are reading the book, he shows that that can be done via a new parliamentary system. He is very interested in performance art and such things. And in 2015, they held a very interesting um, experimental um, event called Make It Work. And there's a good video available on YouTube um, where people begin to represent the interests of non-human actors in a sort of parliament of things. This is a concept that comes from his own earlier work. So yes, it would require a wholesale conceptual recalibration of what it means to be political. And, where, and how would you advise people to sort of approach this book? Well, strictly speaking, this book is best understood in light of that larger work we mentioned earlier, the inquiry into modes of existence. Um, but I would certainly commend Facing Gaia. Um, all the themes of Latour's earlier work are there. But I think in these, as it were, last you know, years of his productive working life, um, this book is his great manifesto. It's topical. It's nuanced. It's abstract and figurative in the way you've remarked. Uh, there's a glorious sort of poet poetic voice that runs through. And yet it has that best of the essayistic quality of Latour's writing. Some people dive into a 2006 book called Politics of Nature. Um, I find that book personally to be extremely difficult and woolly in its style. So I would certainly say Facing Gaia could be top of your list as you begin to embark upon um, Latour. But don't forget those subsequent works, Down to Earth, um, another one I forgot to mention called Where Am I, which I think was translated into English as After Lockdown, a Metamorphosis. So that's tracing some of these themes uh, in the context of the global pandemic. And then that much more recent one on new political class. Hmm. Okay. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add about Facing Guy that you feel you know would be key for a new reader uh, that we haven't touched on? There's one tiny thought, just by way of postscript. It's possible that even when we ad adopt this guy in politics, that it too can be co-opted by corporate interests. I'll give you the little story here. Uh, when Lovelock was working on his ideas about Gaia in the late uh, mid to late 1960s, uh, would you believe he was also employed by Royal Dutch Shell, the <laughs> multinational oil and gas company? So what a position to be in at the very moment that he was working on the extraordinary qualities of the earth uh, with its fragile, delicate um, feedback loops and mechanisms. Uh, he also had an eye on the interests of his employer. Um, they were be asking him to write a report uh, on communicating the impact of their own pollutants in the public domain. And Lovelock was beginning to say to himself, well, now this is interesting. We can't deny that Shell is polluting the atmosphere and that it has real effects on human health. Nobody's going to believe the denial of the science. But what if we can instead promote a picture of the earth as able to heal itself, to rejuvenate itself? So actually, we've now fallen off the horse on the other side, if you like. We've accepted the idea of the earth as a system. Um, but we've now over-animated Gaia as able to um, heal itself in spite of what we do to it. 
And there's some evidence that uh, although Lovelock himself thankfully didn't follow through those ideas for the most part, that uh, corporate fossil fuel com- uh, fossil fuel corporations have indeed uh, adopted that strategy for their own PR. Um, that there's a subtle sense out there, not that they're denying the reality of their own impacts, but that we can trust, we can put our faith in the earth to make it right in the end. So again, I think religion too calls us back into that middle ground to say the earth does have these extraordinary um, regenerative qualities, no doubt, but um, Gaia can be a fearsome beast. And we ourselves are part of that healing. So we need to be aware to have our antennae up as to the subtleties of the marketing messages that are coming at us at this time of crisis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be on guard, fight for the earth. <laughs> and uh, I guess do what you can. Is is Yeah, do what you can. But that comes from a place of honesty and not and of taking on responsibility, seriously, sincerely taking it on. Do what you can and understand that your ethical responsibility is always to ask more questions, to find out where the loops of your agency are going, who and what they're impacting. And in a sense, that is the real ethic of the 21st century. It's not an ethic based on duty or on character anymore. It's one based on feedback loops. And part of the modern condition is to have those loops closed off and black boxed, isn't it? They don't want you to know what the effects of your footprint are, but it's your duty, if you like, as a contemporary person Mm. to push through and to say, no, I need to understand this because that's what it means to be earthbound. Well, that seems like a very helpful and practical place to finish up. Um, yeah, so Tim House, thanks very much for joining us once again. Thank you, James. <laughs>